from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. People love Isabel Wilkerson's book, The Warmth of Other Suns. It moves them, it informs them, and it inspires them. One person wrote a letter to a newspaper in Georgia and said, I rank this as one of the top five books I have ever read. Now, I don't think that was Isabel's mother. In fact, I know it wasn't. It was an authentic letter, and what author doesn't live for that single reader? Isabel's book also has excited the critics. The Washington Post calls it extraordinary and evocative. Another newspaper says it's a landmark piece of nonfiction. A third says it's brilliant and stirring. One very special reader has taken an interest in Isabel's book. That's the reader in chief who lives nearby here in the White House and who went vacationing at Martha's Vineyard this summer and who is said to have Isabel's book in his beach bag. The Warmth of Other Suns tells an epic tale it charts the migration of some mil six million blacks from the south to the north between 1915 and 1970. As Isabel writes, there was the first mass act of independence by a people who were in bondage in this country for far longer than they have been free. The migrants are bound together by a need to escape segregation in the south. And Isabel writes, by their hopeful search for something better, any place but where they were, they did what human beings looking for freedom throughout history have done. They left. The tale of these Southern blacks is uniquely American. They set off for a better life, for the promise of the American dream. And the influence of their great migration was profound, shaping the history of urban life in this country, spreading African American culture, and setting the conditions for the civil rights movement. The story is also Isabel's story. Her own family made the journey north. And for Isabel, things have turned out pretty well. For years, she was a national correspondent and bureau chief for the New York Times. She's the first African-American woman to win a Pulitzer Prize in journalism, and the first black to win for individual reporting. So you see, Isabel knows a good story when she sees one. She has said the black migration she writes about in her book is one of the biggest underreported stories of the 20th century. And it's a big complicated story too. It took her 15 years to research and write. And her dedication earned her the National Book Critics Award for nonfiction. It's my pleasure to introduce Isabel Wilkerson. Thank you so much for that beautiful introduction and thank you so much for every one of you here under this tent to hear me speak. It means so much to me. It's so emotional actually for me to be here in Washington, D.C. I'm a daughter of Washington, D.C. I would not exist literally if it were not for Washington, D.C. Washington, D.C. was the other son for my parents, S.U.N. It was the other son. And it's what drew my parents uh, from the South, deep South, to here in hopes that life might be better for them. And so Washington, D.C., in many respects, was the inspiration for this book. This is the book. This is my copy. This is my copy of the book. You can see it's very well worn. It's called The Salad, actually. It has been all over the country and to Europe. Uh, and uh, it is my version of it. This book took me 15 years to write, to research and to write. It took me 15 years to get to the point where I could stand before you today and talk about it. And that's why it's so special to me. And if this book were a human being, it would be in high school and dating, which is quite frightening. <laughs> but there you have it. That's what it took. The reason why I wanted to immerse myself in something that a lot of us think we know but really truly don't is because 
almost every book begins with a lot of questions. And I had these questions. Where did we come from and what did it take for us to get here? What was the world that the people in this book left? What would propel six million Americans to leave the only place that they'd ever known for a place that they'd never seen in hopes that life might be better? What did it take for them to get out? How did they choose the places that they went? How did they make a way for themselves where they landed? And why didn't they talk about it? And the goal for the book was to have all of us think about and ask ourselves, what would we have done had we been in their places? What would we have done? Now, the, the subtitle of the book, the book is, of course, called The Warmth of Other Suns. And the subtitle is The Epic Story of America's Great Migration. So it would appear that it's about the Great Migration. But in actuality, this book is really about the forebears of, of all Americans, really. These people are proxies for someone in all of our backgrounds, wherever we might have come from, who had to have done what these people did, the people in this book did, just for us to be here today on this soil, in this place, at this time. Somebody had to make this great leap of faith in order for us to be here, someone in all of our backgrounds. If you think about it, how many of us know or are related to or descended from someone, say a great grandmother from Ireland who crossed the Atlantic and then met and married a great grandfather from Ireland, from uh, Italy, Ireland too, parts of Ireland, uh, from Lithuania, Latvia, Russia, Poland, Asia, other parts of the world and created whole new lineages. That is what happened during the course of the Great Migration. People who never would have met, otherwise uh, would, have not, would never have met, actually met and created whole new lineages in the North, the Midwest, and the West. This migration in some ways was one of the great and under, greatest underreported stories of the 20th century, but it also was an unrecognized immigration within the borders of our own country. It began during World War I, and it didn't end until the 1970s. And it is the result of this that the mass majority of people that you might meet, African Americans that you might meet in the North, the Midwest, and West are actually descended from this migration. And that's because when the migration began, 90%, 90% of all African Americans were in the South. By the time that it was over, in the 1970s, half of all African Americans we're living outside of the South. That's a massive relocation of an entire people. And so this is in some ways a universal human story of longing and fortitude and courage that is what in some ways made the country what it is. What these people did though had a different tone to it because these people were defecting a caste system that existed within our country it was a caste system that controlled their every move. In some ways, they were defecting and seeking political asylum from a world that's almost unimaginable to us today, which is why I wanted to be able to understand what it was that they left, to understand the magnitude of what they had done. These people were, in some ways, forced to become the only people in our country's history to have to leave the land of their birth and to go someplace within the borders of their own country just to be recognized as the citizens to which they have been born. So I want to say a little bit about some examples of the absurdity of the world that they were living in. For one thing, it was against the law for an African American, for a black person, and for a white person to merely play checkers together in Birmingham against the law. Someone must have seen a black person and a white person playing checkers together in Birmingham, and maybe they were having a good time, maybe too good of a time. And someone must have seen that and said to themselves, the entire foundation of Southern civilization is in peril and we cannot have this, and actually sat down and wrote this as a law. Throughout the South in courtrooms, there was actually a black Bible and a white Bible to swear to tell the truth on. A black Bible and a white Bible to swear to tell the truth on. And what that meant was that the 
sacred text, the sacred scriptures that many of the people in that region built their entire spiritual worldview on was not acceptable for the two races to touch. And I found out about this through reading a newspaper article in which it was referred to not because of the absurdity of it, but because it had actually disrupted a trial that was in progress because they could not find the black Bible for the witness to take the, to swear to tell the truth on. And so that meant the bailiff and the sheriff had to search the whole courtroom in order to find the Bible for them to be able to resume the trial. And I've been asked since I've talked about this, well, were there different versions of the Bible that they were to be, said? was there a King James version for the white witnesses and maybe the American standard for the black witnesses. And it turned out it was the same one, it's just that they could not touch the same sacred text. I've been all over the country talking about this, uh, the, the absurdity of the world that they lived in, and I, I find that one of my most challenging and beautifully challenging audiences happen to be high school students. And so I try to make it come alive for them as I do for the reader. And I came upon, well, it's in the book, but the one that I settled on that seemed to make the difference for them is one that will, is based upon a question I'm going to ask you. I'd like to see a show of hands of those of you who in the last week have been driving and actually passed another driver on the road. Yes. I mean, really, the, the two people who didn't raise their hands, you know you must have done it in the last couple of weeks. I mean, really. <laughs> and, uh, and it's funny, when I ask the question, people seem to be a little quizzical, like, is there a new rule that, we're not, that I don't know about? <laughs> uh, as far as I know, it's perfectly legal. But if you were African American during the era of Jim Crow, which began in the late 19th century and did not end until the civil rights legislation of the 1960s, which meant it went on for three, for more than three generations, and into the lifespan of many, many Americans alive today. If you were African American, you could not pass, uh, you could not pass a white person, a white uh, motorist on the road, no matter how slowly they were going. And that alone would probably account for a couple million right there being willing to say, I'm leaving. And so when I tell this to the, seat, to the uh, high school students, I was uh, sharing that with high school students and, uh, in Hawaii, actually. And I heard this murmuring in the back of the room where someone said, well, I would have honked. <laughs> and when they said that, I had to say, now let's start again. Let's start again. If you could not pass individuals on the road, you most certainly could not honk. And so then someone else said, well, knowing that maybe I wasn't supposed, they weren't supposed to make any noise, well, I would have tailgated then. And I would say, if you couldn't pass them on the road and you couldn't honk, you couldn't tailgate either. And isn't it, in some ways, a beautiful thing to realize that this is so far removed from the reality of young people today, because of all that has happened, in part because of this great migration, that they cannot fathom the world that propelled this great movement of people. Now, uh, a little bit about this, this uh, caste system that they were living in. This caste system was created in many respects to ensure the economy of the South. The South relied on not just a supply of cheap labor, but an oversupply of cheap labor in order to plant and chop, tend and harvest the tobacco, the cotton, the sugar cane, and the rice that were the staples of southern, uh, the Southern economy. And they needed to make sure the people were ready and available, uh, an oversupply, so that the labor costs would be as low as they possibly could be. Many of the people, of course, were working, uh, were working not even being paid. They were working for the right to live on the land that they were farming. They were sharecroppers. And so they were in a very difficult fix uh, all along. This migration did not begin until something happened that would affect the entire world, and that was World War I. There had been people who'd wanted to leave for many, many, many decades, but they didn't leave until the opportunity arose and World War I began. And it was World War I 
in which the North had a problem. The North needed labor, and that's because there were there was this uh, a loss of labor of people who had been European immigrants who had been working the foundries and the factories and the steel mills of the North, and they had a great need for labor, and they began to go to the South to find the cheapest labor in the land, and that was African Americans in the South, again, many of whom were not working for pay but for the right to live on the land that they were farming. And so what, they had ended up, what that ended up doing was it meant that African Americans in all of the major northern cities that we know were actually, they arrived at the express invitation of the North. That is how this began. The, the South, however, did not take kindly to this poaching of their cheap labor. They did everything they could to keep the people from leaving. They would arrest the people on the railroad platforms as they were preparing to go on the northbound platforms. They would arrest them from their train seats as they were attempting to go. And when there were too many people to arrest, they would wave the train on through so that people who had been waiting for months and months and months for the chance to get to freedom had to watch that train leave without them and then figure out how were they going to get out. This migration is so huge, though, that I decided to tell the story, The Warmth of Other Suns, from the standpoint of three individual people. The three represent the six million. And those three people are amazing, extraordinary individuals in their own right. And they each follow the three major trajectories of this migration. This migration, like any migration, is not a haphazard unfurling of lost souls. It, is an, it was an orderly redistribution of people along the most direct routes to what they perceive, perceived as freedom. And so that meant that when you're in the North, even now, you can almost tell where a person is from on the basis of the city that they happen to be in in the North. And that's because people followed three distinctive routes. And the route that brought people to Washington brought my parents here was a route that took people from Florida, Georgia, the Carolinas, and Virginia to Washington, D.C., which was the first stop, then on to Philadelphia, New York, and on north. There was a second stream that took people from Mississippi, Alabama, Arkansas, Tennessee, to Chicago and Cleveland and the entire Midwest. And then there was a third stream that carried people from uh, Louisiana and Texas to California and the entire West Coast. In other words, Every migration is in some ways a referendum on the place the people have left, and it's, a, and it's a show of belief and faith that this new place will be better. And the beauty of any migration is that people follow certain streams so that it's almost a predictable outcome as to where they will go. In the same way that if you were to go to Minnesota, you would find that there are a lot of people from Scandinavia, because that is where that migration stream left them. Now, this migration, as any migration, often occurs because, not because of the individuals themselves, a lot of them have already suffered in some ways whatever it is that they had to face in the South or wherever they happen to be coming from. Any migration, which is how all of us ultimately got to where we are, happens because someone across the Atlantic, across the Pacific, across the Rio Grande, decides that they want something better for themselves, but more importantly for their children and, their, and the unseen grandchildren and the unseen great-grandchildren, meaning all of us. And that means that they have to make a great sacrifice in order to do that. And in many respects, what this does is it means that these migrations are, in some ways, leaderless revolutions that occur one person added to another person, added to another person, being able to change history. And that is what happens when you have large masses of people leaving. Now, one way that this migration changed our country was it was the very first time in our history, in American history, that the lowest caste people signaled that they had options and they were willing to take them. There had been efforts to resist the problems and the challenges and the restrictions and in some ways the violence of the South for many decades, but it wasn't until World War I that the people began to act upon that. This was the first time in our history that the lowest caste people showed that they had options and were willing to take them.
It also meant that you know, the civil rights movement would have happened ultimately, but this propelled the civil rights movement to happen even more quickly than it would have otherwise. And that's because while there had been resistance all along, there had been very little attention given to it in many parts outside of the South. And many of those efforts at, at uh, changing the South were crushed before they could even get started. And so when these people left, they began to exert press pressure on the North to take, to take notice just by their being there. If you think about American history and how America gets involved in conflicts in other parts of the world, you realize that a lot of times America gets involved when there are a large percentage of people, a large enough group of people from that part of the world, whether Northern Ireland or parts of the Middle East, who by their very presence can exert pressure on the United States to intervene. And the same happened with this great migration. By having large numbers of African Americans in New York, in Washington, D.C., in Chicago, in Boston, and all of these other places in the North where there was great in industry, where the media were based, suddenly the cameras and the attention and the reporters began to go down and pay attention. It's as if trees were falling but no one was there to hear them. And finally, there were. This migration also, this outpouring of millions of people, people who had been the lifeblood of the workers in the South, this outpouring of people did other things. It served notice to the South, whether it wanted to hear it or not, that something was happening and that they were going to have to address it. In many respects, they actually became, became harsher on the people who were there. In other cases, they began to loosen. But ultimately, it created a safety valve for those who decided to stay. Those who decided to stay now had options that they had never had before. Suddenly, everybody knew someone in the new world, as was the case for people who lived in other parts of the world and had relatives in America. They also were sending money back home to help support the efforts, to support their families, as all immigrants do. And so all of these things combined helped to propel accelerate the move toward civil rights. And finally, many of the people who stayed would often visit people in the north. They would visit the relatives that they had. Everybody had an uncle, an aunt, a, a person who lived across the road from them, a minister, someone that they knew who was now in the north. And they would come and visit. And they would see how freer the people were in this new land. And they would go back and they would say to themselves, why can't we have this here in the land of our birth? And one of the most important people who ever said that to himself was Martin Luther King, who had the opportunity to go to Boston University, to Boston, from Georgia, and to where he met his wife, Coretta Scott. He would never have met her had, there not been, had he not been a part of this movement. And he was one of those people who saw the freedoms limited even though they might have been in those days, but freedoms nonetheless. And he went back clearly, as that was an inspiration for him to go back and lead the final battle for freedom. And so this migration had many impacts north and south. But I think to me, what I want, what I would love people to take away from this, from this book is beyond the fact that, first of all, there are three amazing stories of people with great fortitude, courage, and great sense of humor. Just amazing people who I had the privilege of getting to know. Ida Mae Brandon Gladney, who was a cotton picker, who was terrible at picking cotton. You don't think about people being good or bad at it, but she happened to have been really bad at it. You know, not everybody's cut out for that. And I also think about George Starling, who had, who uh, 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 Ida Mae Gladney left Mississippi for Chicago and uh, George Starling, who attempted in a small way to try to get little better wages and treatment for people who were picking citrus fruit in Florida. And as a result of his, his uh, small and quiet efforts to try to do that, ended up having to flee for his life from Florida to get to Harlem uh, to safety because there had been a lynching in the works uh, that was planned for him. And then finally, of a Dr. Robert Joseph Pershing Foster who left Monroe, Louisiana for California because he could not practice surgery in his own hometown of Monroe. And that was a journey that I recreated myself by renting a Buick, 
uh, as he had. He said, if you'd seen his Buick, you would have wanted it too. <laughs> and I recreated that journey. I wanted to be able to see what it was like to drive that far without being able to stop. During that era, African Americans in the 1940s, 1950s, and into the 1960s could not be assured of a place to rest, to get gas, to uh, recharge their batteries, to be able to even eat, to even get a meal. And so they had to take great care, great planning, and caution. After a certain point, the assumption was one could stop, but it turned out he had a very difficult time. And so I attempted to recreate that journey. I rented this Buick as he had had. I had my parents with me as, as generational tour guides. And we got to the dangerous, uh, frightening part of the journey where you're going through the desert and it's night and I had not slept for hours as he had. It had gone on for many, many, many hours and into the night without being able to rest. And my parents were with me as I was about to veer off the road. And at that point, we're in the mountains. We're, in, we're, we're, we're seeing the signs that say 80 miles to the next gas station. I mean, it is a forbidding area and terrain and part of our country. These states are countries unto themselves. So I was veering off the road, and my parents said, you need to stop the car. And if you won't stop the car, let us out. <laughs> we will tell you about it. We'll tell you about it. We'll tell you everything that you need. And so we, we stopped the car in Yuma, Arizona, because it was no longer 1953. Things had changed so much. We have a long way to go as a country. But things had changed so much that we had no trouble finding a place. We had a choice of places. And that actually made me feel even more empathy for what he had gone through, because he had not had that option. This migration uh, is so inspirational, I think, to or should be or could be for all of us if we think about it. Because this was a leaderless revolution. There was no one, as in any migration, who sounds the day or the hour of any migration movement. These were individuals who made decisions that they thought was best for them and their children and unseen grandchildren. In some ways, it, it renews one's faith in the power of the individual decision. It's almost as if they realized within their bones that there were too many people, too many of them, concentrated in one part of the country, one region of the country. They said, there are too many of us here. Our, very, our, our work is devalued, our very lives are devalued. Perhaps we will fare better elsewhere. And so they set out on journeys that took them from Portland, Maine to Portland, Oregon. They went all over the United States within the borders of their own country, as immigrants would, even though they had not been truly immigrants. And so when you think about this, you think about the fact that it took this great migration for this group of people, the lowest caste people, to ultimately gain the independence that they had deserved all along on many respects. If you think about it, these people, one added to another, added to another, were able to do, as individuals, what a president of the United States could not do, Abraham Lincoln, did what the Emancipation Proclamation could not do. They did what both houses of Congress could not do. They did what the powers that be, North and South, could not or would not do. They freed themselves. They freed themselves. And that is in some ways, thank you. That in some ways, should be an inspiration, I think, for all of us who benefit in ways that are hard to even imagine from what the people did. In some ways, what they did helped to open worlds up for people that we now view as, as icons of the 20th century, all, all, ultimately changing 20th century culture as we know it. In literature, Toni Morrison, whose parents migrated from Alabama to Ohio, had they made the decision to not do that, she would have been raised in a world in which it was actually against the law for African Americans to go into a library and take out a library book. 
And you kind of need to be able to get a library book now and then if you're going to become a Nobel laureate. People such as Richard Wright and, uh, and August Wilson, Lorraine Han Hansberry, almost all of their work was devoted to, if you think about the content of their work, was devoted to understanding this migration and the impact that it had had on the country and on themselves. It fed a whole world of art and culture that we now view as 20th century culture, but actually is the culture and art that grew out of, the out of this great migration. All of the works primarily of Romare Bearden and of Jacob Lawrence, if you can recall all of those indicators, are manifestations of the great migration. 20th century African American and thus American culture is hard to separate from the culture of the great migration because, it's, because it is the children who had been freed from the strictures of Jim Crow who were now free to explore and be their truest creative selves as a result of the sacrifice of their parents. When you think about jazz, you think about Miles Davis who's whose uh, parents had migrated from Arkansas to Illinois, where he had the luxury of being able to spend the hours it would take to become the master of, the, of, his, of his instrument and to create a whole new form of music. And you think of Thelonious Monk, whose parents left uh, North Carolina for Harlem and had what would have happened had they not made that decision when he was five years old, where he would get a chance to rec have his genius flourish in the way that it did. And then you think of John Coltrane, who also came from North Carolina, ended up in Philadelphia, where believe it or not, that is where he got his first alto sax. His first alto sax. And you think about so many people in sports, from Jesse Owens to, uh, to Jackie Robinson, to even current day people such as Magic Johnson, and on and on and on, and Bill Russell. None of them, very few of them, would have even had the opportunity to have become the legends that we know them to be had their parents not made the sacrifice to leave the place, the only place they'd ever known, for some place far away so that their children could actually benefit from it. And so one of the things I want to leave, with you, leave you with before, uh, before taking your questions are two things. One is the, the short passage that is the epigraph to this book. It's the epigraph, the words of Richard Wright, who was one of the most famous people, obviously the, one of the greatest uh, novelists of the 20th century who wrote Native Son, uh, and who was himself a person who participated in the Great Migration. These are his words, and the words that give the book its title. And these are the words that he was thinking as he was preparing to leave Mississippi for the first time and venture forth to a place he'd never seen called Chicago. He is a proxy for all of the ancestors that we may have who made this great leap of faith. He wrote, I was leaving the South to fling myself into the unknown. I was taking a part of the South to transplant in alien soil, to see if it could grow differently, if it could drink of new and cool rains, bend in strange winds, respond to the warmth of other suns, and perhaps to bloom. It's a prayer, really, for sustenance and survival and protection on the road ahead, which can be in some ways an inspiration for all of us wherever we happen to be, whatever the journey may be and wherever it may take us. And I want to leave you with this moment, this idea this is a moment that had to have occurred in all of our lineages in order for us to be here at this moment, at this place, on this soil, at this time. Someone had to have experienced this moment for us to be here. And that is the moment of departure. That moment of departure meant that there was someone, usually a, a young person, because this is a young person's decision. People who are older often are not able to make this journey, but it's a young person's decision. That moment of departure means there's a young person in all of our backgrounds who was standing at the railroad platform or at the dock about to board a boat across 
an ocean or about to cross a border of some kind to get to the United States. And at that place, at that platform or at that dock, were the few people who had been important in raising that individual. There would have been a mother, a father, a grandparent, an aunt, whomever it might have been who was responsible for their even being there. And that person could not make the crossing with this young person. That person did not know when they would see this child again. And that child did not know when they would see the person who'd raised them ever again. Remember, there was no Skype. There was no email. There were no cell phones. There were no guarantees. And the next time that they might hear of that mother or that father, that person who had raised them, might be a telegram. That was what they were using in those days. A telegram saying that your father has passed away or your mother is very ill. You are to come back quickly if you are to see them alive, see her alive. And that moment had to have happened just for all of us to be here. And I find great, a great sense of awe at the courage and the fortitude of what it took for them to make that sacrifice. And this book, in some ways, is a plea that we redefine what we call heroes in this country, that we redefine what we consider leaders, because all of us have it within our own DNA, the answers to so many questions that may plague us because of what people went through before in order for us to get here today. And I truly believe that the message of all of this is that if these people could do what they did with absolutely nothing, then that means that we, their heirs, there's nothing that we can't do. There's nothing that we cannot do. And in fact, there are things that we must do to make their sacrifice worth it. Thank you so much, and I'm happy to take your questions. Thank you. Thank you. Which side, I guess? <laughs> what did you find uh, unique, noteworthy, mythical about the ultimate destinations of where African American people chose to migrate? Uh, specifically, what did you find out about your family's motivation to ch choose to come to Washington, D.C.? Well, actually, I have to say that I'm a journalist first, and therefore, the stories are primarily about uh, the larger tableau of this migration, and I wanted to tell it through three people so that uh, the reader could identify with these protagonists, see themselves in the people that I've written about, feel that they're in the car with Dr. Foster as he's about to drive off the road, see themselves as if they're sitting uh, on the train with Ida Mae with her two children and her husband as they're setting forth for a place that they'd never seen. But one of the realities and one of the reasons why I have such a sense of awe and, uh, and appreciation and gratitude for what any immigrant or migrant has to go through is that, is that the places that they go often greatly want the labor, need the labor, but oddly enough, sometimes don't want the people. And that's kind of, you know, I mean, how do you have both, really? And so that meant that all of the people streaming into these major industrial cities during the era of the Great Migration, which went on again from World War I until well into the 20th century, into the 1970s, all of them had many, many challenges that they had to face as they were going into, uh, into places where uh, they, their, their, their labor was needed, but they were often brought in as strike breakers. They were pitted one against the other immigrants against the uh, uh, native-born migrants from the South. And so 
their uh, arrival in these cities was often quite harrowing for them. They had come from a place where, believe it or not, every four days an African American was lynched for some perceived breach of the caste system that I described. And they arrived in places where they did not have to so much worry about that on a daily basis, but they had to worry about whether they'd be able to get work, where they might be able to live. They were consigned to places that were overcrowded and where they were overcharged for the subdivided uh, tenements where they were living. And so life was very hard for them. And one of the reasons that I find such uh, an inspiration from what they went through in all immigrants, really, is because for an immigrant, failure is not an option. They have to succeed because there's no backup for them back at home. The people back home are looking to see if they can make it and often are looking for uh, help or they're often bragging back home about someone that they know who's gone up north and they're looking to them to succeed. So they had to make a go of it on their own. And my heart goes out to all that they went through and all that any immigrant goes through. And this book, in some ways, the people are proxies for anyone who's ever gone through that. So I should take this side. Good afternoon, Ms. Wilkerson. Thank you for that great book. Um, weeks after I read it, I realized that there were no illustrations or pictures of the people. And I know you drew good word pictures of them. Thank you for that and their struggles. <laughs> But it hit me, why were there no pictures? There were no pictures because my editor and I simultaneously agreed that we wanted you to picture yourself and not be distracted by what you thought they looked like. We wanted you to see yourself, but more importantly, your grandparents, your great-grandparents, your parents, and yourself. We wanted it to be a universal human story. And that's what we believe it was. Thank you so much for that. Hi, um, my family came from Virginia. I'm from Philadelphia, so that's part of that migration. It's classic. Uh, yeah, <laughs> I, then the New York is the next train stop. You know, we call it the two-state jump, I would always say it that way. But why do you think they did not go on to Canada? You, you mentioned the three unite within the borders. You said that a couple times, but Canada would, was in theory freer and maybe whatever. Why not Canada? My, uh, the question was why didn't they go on to Canada as had occurred during the Underground, Migr underground Railroad. And uh, one of the reasons is because they were American. And they were American citizens. And it's my belief that they believed that within the borders of their country, they should be recognized as the citizens to which they had been. They had descended from people who had been in this country for centuries. Even to this day, African Americans who are descended from slaves as a group have lived fewer years as free people than in slavery. And it will take another 100 years before that, uh, that balance is made even. That is how long slavery had existed in this country. And in some ways, I believe it was a staking of a claim of their citizenship in this country. Yes. My, I'm going to um, ask you to thank Isabel Wilkerson. Okay. And in seven minutes, the conversation will continue with Book TV. They'll be taking live calls and answering more of your questions. So I'm going to put you on hold for about <laughs> seven minutes. Please stay with us. And thank you so much. Thank you. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.